testing. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I believe the Sabbath school lesson this morning was, was very powerful. We were reminded of certain things that are very important. And this morning, we're going to remember um, certain aspects of our salvation that are fundamental to our salvation. And I'm going to cover basically a lot of time or time periods here. So we're going to start rather quickly. Um, before we start, I want to ask the Lord to bless us once again in the opening of his word. So if you can bow your heads for prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We are prone to earth, dear Father, and you know it so well. Who can understand the heart? We can't even understand our own heart. But your word says that there's a God in heaven that can read the mind and the hearts, the intentions of it, to give each one according to their works. And dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace to ask that you open our hearts, that you prove our mind and our thoughts, that you lead us back to you. May our hearts be drawn to you and may whatever draws our hearts to you may it be the love of Christ and his sacrifice for us. And as we open your word, make us hearers of your word and doers of it. May your Holy Spirit impress our minds and our hearts. And as we leave your sanctuary, may we go out in our hearts with the determination of shining your light and being light bearers throughout the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The title of the message for this morning is Light Bearers. I don't know if you can see that there, but Light Bearers is the title of this message. Sister White, in the book Evangelism, it's very hard for me to read right there. I don't know if you can read it, but it says, in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and what? and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given the most, the work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Is there any way that we can have the lights towards the projector here just dimmed a little bit, just for my eyes' sake, please? Is there any way to dim these lights right here, please? I think that's better, yes. Thank you. Very well, so we have been set, we have been called to be light bearers in this world. And it's a solemn responsibility that God has bestowed upon us. It's a blessing in reality, to have the light throughout so many years of history come and been bestowed to us. We are responsible for this light and to give this light to the world. The book of Isaiah in the chapter 60, verse 2, Isaiah looking into the, into, the, into the future, he beheld that there would be a time coming upon this world in which darkness would envelop the whole world and gross darkness, the people. But in that time, he also saw people arise and shine with the glory of Christ. And that time has come. Certainly, darkness has been enveloping the world. You all can see it. It's palpable. It's present. It's real. But God's calling to us is also real. And it comes to us throughout the ages. The question is, how did we get here? How did this world, which was created with light, in the beginning, God spoke and there was light. How did it come to this condition in that which now we have darkness? And gross darkness has enveloped the minds of the people. How did we get here? I want to take you all the way back to where it all started. And the story that I'm going to relate to you is also a story of love. Not the type of love stories that we find in Hollywood and all these other movies. This is real love story. Beautiful story. 
I put several slides so that the kids and the younger people could actually appreciate it better. And for those of us that have a short attention span can actually appreciate it as well. But I'll move quick. I know we're starting to get hungry. <laughs> so this story of love, this fourth story started before the throne room of God. Where did it start? Where did it start? Before the throne room of God, where thousands upon thousands and millions, I would say, of beings created by the Creator, by God, were present. Everyone was in peace. Joy reigned forever from eternity to eternity. However, something happened. One of the covering cherubs, I don't know if you could appreciate that, but that's the, al the, 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 alt the altar of where the Ten Commandments are. One of the covering cherubs decided to rebel. You know the story. What was his name? His name was Lucifer. He was a covering cherub. What was he covering? What was it that he was covering? The glory of God, right? We see it represented here in the ark. But what else was under the mercy seat? What was there? The law of God. This covering angel, he was covering the glory of God under which the mercy seat was the law of God, the foundation of his throne, of his kingdom. He was there as a protector, a light bearer of this truth and this love of the law of love. However, for some mysterious reason, that thing that he was supposed to protect and cover, he rebelled against it. He rebelled. And he accused God before the thousands of people or beings that were there present before the throne room of God. He accused God of being unfair and his law of being unjust and unworthy to keep. We know the story, how he was thrown from heaven. He was cast down. And now God began a work of creation in this world. We know that the Bible says that God created Adam and Eve with his hands out of the dust, right? And I imagine with so much, such loving care, God, you know, creating every aspect, detail of the human body. And it's such a marvelous, if you could say, machinery that it, 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 it continues to marvel scientists to this day. How the body has been created is really a work of art. And there you have the Creator placing Adam and Eve in this wonderful, wonderful garden. Beautiful garden. Now, what was the name of this garden? Eden. Eden. Very good. I want to invite you to go with me to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, verse 13. And that's Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. We are going to see that this was the living space of this other being that was cast down. And it's very interesting. It says here about Lucifer, it says, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald with gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. So who was in Eden before Adam and Eve were even there, were placed there? Lucifer. Lucifer. That was his home. And God created Adam and Eve and placed them in Eden to replace that empty void, that void, that voided space. Now, we know that the definition of a sanctuary is very, can, you know, involve certain aspects, not only a sacred place, but sanctuary can also mean a building room for religious worship, yes, just like this one, 
But a sanctuary can also mean a place that provides safety, protection, a wildlife sanctuary. And I want you to see Eden as part of the sanctuary. He was in the sanctuary, was cast out, and now that God created Adam and Eve, they were placed in this sanctuary, as you would say. And there they had a communion, direct communion, face to face with God. It was a special moment they had with God. Very happy times they lived there. And we know the story that sadly, there you go, sadly, through sin, they were also casted out. And this love story, as I would say, would actually start to evolve here. Because this God of love, this God that had created with such care Adam and Eve, was now looking for a way to bring Adam and Eve back to him. And the way that he established through his word and throughout time for his people to come back to him was through this method right here that we call the sanctuary. Psalm 77, verse 11 through 13 says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy works and talk of thy doings. Then it says, Thy way, O God, is in where? Is in the sanctuary. Thy way to what? The way to salvation. The way back to what? Back to God. The way back to the sanctuary, back to Eden. That's where God wanted his people to go. And here is a quick, you know, representation of the sanctuary. Um, and through the daily sacrifices that the people of ancient Israel would go to, we talk today about remembering. God wanted his people to remember daily, remember the path back to him, the path back to salvation, the path back to Eden. They would go and take their lamb, and what's the first piece of furniture they would have to encounter there? The altar of sacrifice. Thank you. After that, we would have what? The laver. Very good. What would we have in the holy place? The table of showbread. Very good. What else? The seven golden candlesticks. The altar of incense. And then if we would go into the most holy place, what would we have there? The Ark of the Covenant, right? So throughout the years since, you know, the establishment of the sanctuary, the people of God would go and they would observe this whole process play out in front of them. Many say like a play, but it wasn't a play. It was a representation of how they could go back into an intimate communion with God through a daily sacrifice, baptism, the word of God through the bread, prayer, the lampstand or the, the golden lamp, and finally, the law of God, which was in the most holy place. Sadly, we know the story, the ancient Israel forgot, right? We talked about it in the Sabbath school lesson, how we're so prone to forgetting. How um, Dr. Dr. Villalvaso here was saying how many times our limbic system is so stimulated that it atrophies the hippocampus, right? And it doesn't allow us to remember certain things that are pertinent for our salvation. And through the times of the judges, with, after Joshua, the book of actually Judges says that, or the book of Joshua says that the people of God forgot the God that had liberated and had done so many marvelous things. They forgot. And through the times of the kings, it got even worse. Instead of being a light, light bearers to the world through this message of the sanctuary, they began to mix truth with paganism. 
right? The mingle, the holy with the profane. It came to such a bad condition that some of their idols were actually introduced into the sanctuary. And in this way, the whole way of salvation was perverted. And people lost their way. So as a way, God took the sanctuary message for a time from them for 70 years, and they were sent captives. And I'm, you guys know all this story. I'm just recalling it so you guys can remember. We can remember. I can remember. And you know the story. They came back. The temple was built again, reconstructed, right? In the time of Nehemiah and the book of uh, Ezra also, God brought up people to bring up this sanctuary message. And a lot of times when I read the book of Nehemiah and I see his tears, his prayers, his worry for the, for the holy city, when I see Ezra so tirelessly working for the building of the temple, I think, why were they so anxious about this? Well, they were so anxious because this was the way of salvation. This was the only way that we could go back to an intimate communion with God. And it was of essence that this be rebuilt. And it was rebuilt. But again, throughout the 400 years that then, you know, passed to the coming of Jesus Christ, again, the people of God forgot. They forgot the essence of the truth of the sanctuary. And they got more involved and more emphasized on the traditions than in what the meaning of what they were doing on mercy and justice and love. And they forgot the essence of it. You all know the story. Jesus Christ came. When he died, the veil was torn in two. And now this message was taken away from the Jewish nation and given to the whole world. And I see in my mind, I see when the time when, you know, the, the first um, Mary Magdalene and the women that followed Jesus saw, heard the news from the angels that he had risen. I imagine the time when, you know, the two disciples that walk into Emos, they, they heard and they saw Jesus Christ finally appear before them when he was blessing the bread when they ran back to give the news, I imagine these were the first missionaries going out to the whole world. We have a message, a new message. Christ has risen. And now he is going up to the sanctuary. And there we have a living intercessor that brought himself to be just like me, to intercede for me. And now the gate, the way back to the sanctuary, to the Holy of Holies, has been opened. But the Bible also prophesied that a time would come. And here, very quickly, before we go, here's a table of showbread. And you guys remember a, a, a verse that would, uh, uh, you know, back up that this is the word of God? It's right there. What does it say? Deuteronomy 8.3. Can you guys help me read it? Very good. It also represented, it was on the side of the north, and it represented also the throne of God, right? So right here, what does the, the altar of incense rep represent? Here in Psalm 141, verse uh, 12. Can you guys read it, please? That's incense. Very good. Thank you. And now, the lamps, then. What does this mean? And Matthew 5.16, can you read this for me? Thank you. Powerful verses that back up that these articles in the sanctuary are essential to our salvation. Now, we had a power. And here you see it, there's a, in the dark, there's a dragon there. We had a power that was prophesied that would come up and would try to interfere between man's salvation or his path back to God. Would try to get on the, in the way, in this path, 
and would pervert all these things, all these biblical sanctuary truths in the way to impede that man go back to Eden, to a place where he was cast out too. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 25, it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given unto his hand until a time and times and, and a dividing of times. So this we know it, mean, it, may, it means that it would be given into his hands for 1,260 days, right? Daniel 8, 25 says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be giving, sorry, yeah, and they shall be giving unto his hand, until time, uh, sorry, I've just repeated the whole same thing. It says, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed and restored. So, throughout the time that came after the Christian, church grew and, and expanded throughout the world there came another apostasy, right? And we know that this apostasy was a mixture of the sacred with the profane. Under Emperor Constantine, there came a flood of pagan rituals which started to involve the whole church, right? And here we have, instead of the sacrifice of Christ, we had another pagan ritual come in and was introduced to take its place, the Eucharist. And here, it is believed that through some words, you know, you can bring up Christ back to life and at the same time, sacrifice him again, which is kind of blasphemous, where it really is blasphemous. And in the same way, if you see it, the pagan ritual was actually a symbolism of the worship of the sun god, right? You see it right there, the sun god coming in and coming out, the whole thing where they, they worship the sun. The labor, where baptism, baptism was represented, and we, last night when we were doing our devotional, we read about the importance of baptism. And when Peter preached, you know, to the, to the Jewish nation right there in Jerusalem at Pentecost, the people asked, what shall we do? What did Peter respond? Repent, and what? Be baptized, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. But this was perverted, and then we have infant baptism. Can an infant repent? No, they, they can't repent. The table of showbread, the Bible, the Word of God, that's the bread of life, it was changed quite literally. When Martin Luther went to read the Bible, it was actually chained to a pillar, and he would go there and start reading. It was chained. It wasn't only chained, but it was also told to the people, you cannot understand the Word of God. It's too confusing. It's too difficult for you to understand this. So we, the priest, which have been set up by God, will translate or will explain the Word of God for you. And no wonder we have the dark ages after that, right? Instead of the incense, the altar of incense, where we can communicate with God and our prayers can ascend to Christ, we now have the introduction of what? What was this called? The confessional, right? And look at the symbolism. I don't know if you see it very well there, but look at the symbolism. There's a curtain between man and the priest. You see that? There's a curtain between man and the priest. You get it? The sanctuary? So what place is the, the priest taking? It's taking the place of God. Blasphemous. So instead of being able to go to God himself and intercede by faith, by faith, introduce yourself to the other side of the curtain, now you have to confess your sins to a priest who was taking the place of God. The Latin stand, which meant or resembled or testified that we are to be a light to the world, it was effectively, almost effectively, turned away by the sacrifice of so many martyrs. 
you were not allowed to testify of your faith to others, or you would be killed, right? You couldn't read your Bible. You couldn't own a Bible. You couldn't have worship with your kids. If you're found to be having worship with your kids, the mother would be sent off to work. The father would be burned at the stake, and the children would be taken to be educated by the bishops. So, yes, this was the power of the dragon trying to intercede and to intercept or to block that path back to God. And this picture, I think I found it in the internet, and it, and it says a lot of, like, thousands of words here. But you have, you have the Pope right there, right? What do you have on the sides right there? I don't know if you see it right there. Cherubs. Very good. Cherubs. You see the cherubs right there in gold? Not only that, how many people, human beings, are up there? Three? There's four. And in Revelation, when, when John describes, you know, God, what does he have around him? Or also Ezekiel says it. He has four living creatures around him and the cherubs that cover his glory. This is utterly blasphemy, right? A man taking the place of God. But we have through history, we're going down the line of history. I think we've gone over 4,000 years already. We've gone through history, and the Bible says that the sanctuary would be cleansed. Other versions says, say that it would be restored. And brought, God brought people, or men and women, who brought up these lights back to life again. They were light bearers. And this man was known as the morning star, John Wycliffe. What did John Wycliffe bring back to the world? He brought the word of God. That's right. He was one of the first men to translate the word of God to the common language so that people could understand the word of God. He said, you don't need priests. You don't need a pope to tell you what the Bible stands for, what, what it says. You can go directly to the Word of God and know the will of God, the will of your Father for you there. He brought the Word of God again and effectively restored the altar or the, the, the table of showbread. And little by little, God came, started bringing up men. This is, I don't even see the name. I don't know why it doesn't come up. But do you know who this is? This is Martin Luther. And what did Ma Martin Luther fight for? What did he say? Huh? The indulgences, remember? Hey, you don't need to go pay indulgences. You could just go to Christ. Go to Christ, you know, and, 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 and by faith, trust in his sacrifice. When he was, you know, kneeling and going up those stairs, all of a sudden this verse flies through his mind. You guys recall this, right? And said, the just by faith will live. Sister White says that he stood up in embarrassment and walked out of Rome to never return. The just will live by faith. And there he restored the altar of sacrifice. We have these great men right here. It's not only John Calvin here. Um, you can find this in, uh, in, in Europe. I forgot what country it is. But the one right there, the most prominent one, is John Calvin. The one on his right is uh, Pharaoh. The, one on, the two on his left is uh, Beza. And the one on the far left is John Knox. Now, brothers and sisters, these were great men. Men that the book of Hebrews says, men that, men that the world is not worthy of. The world is w really not worthy of these great men. But you know what? God wants men like these and women like these in these days too. These are very great men in the books of heaven. And John Calvin basically said, you know what? We don't need to pray to a priest. We could just pray to our Heavenly Father. We could go directly to him. And John Calvin, he basically brought back the truth of the incense of altar that was represented there, the Presbyterian church. Time passed again, and John, uh, sorry, the Lord brought up another man, John Smith. You guys know who this is? 
John Smith, the founder of the Baptist Church. So John Smith came up and said, you know, told to the people, you don't, we don't, you know, the whole thing of baptizing little kids is not biblical. You have to be grown and have a conscience and know what you're doing and repent from your sins. And this is where the Baptist Church came up. Great men that started to bring back and establish again the truths of the sanctuary, the way back to God. John Wesley, do you guys know who this is? John Wesley. John Wesley was a founder of the Methodist Church. The Methodist Church. Now, John Wesley, when he came around, he said he had a burden in his heart. He said, why do we just have to be preaching to our own? And, and, and why don't we go outside of our churches and go and get more people into the world, into the church? Why don't we go rescue the sinner and bring them back to, to God? So his message was, we need to be lights in this world. And this is where the Methodist church came up. This is the truth of the what? Seven branch candlestick, right? Where we should be a light to the world. And in this way, the Lord, step by step through the years, slowly started to restore the truths of the sanctuary, the path back to Eden, the, ba the path back to salvation. And we have several articles that have been restored. And the light that has been brought to us throughout the years is, has been growing. Has been growing and growing. We have at the end of this time, after John Wesley and all these great men, prophecy said that there would be a falling of the stars. The sun would go dark and the moon would go red. Remember this. And a special time would come. We would go now from the holy. We already restored the articles from the, from the outer court, from the holy. And now we're going to move in time to the what? To the most holy. And as a signal, God prophesied that there would be falling of stars. We would see signs in the heavens and also in the earth. And when this happened, God brought this man up. What's his name? William Miller. A man that in the beginning... They didn't love God. They didn't really obey him. They didn't want to know. He was a deist. He, he made fun of things of God, right? But through his experience in war and one of the times where a bomb just fell very close to him, once he came back to his, to his farm, he started thinking about life and death, and he was worried. He's like, what's going to happen to me when I die? Is that it? You see, without God, there's no hope. There's nothing. There's just a black hole without any light. And he said, well, I don't have any other way out, so let me go back to the Bible and start reading. And this man, brothers and sisters, this guy really dove into the Bible. It says that he wouldn't pass a verse until he really understood it, and he would compare verse with verse, having the Bible interpret itself. And there he found that time was short. It was coming to an end that this world, he thought, being the sanctuary, would be cleansed. And his preaching was, hey, wake up. Christ is coming. Did it have an effect? Yes. <laughs> the world awoke like a drunkard that's woken up. And they said, wow, what, am I ready? This is true. The Bible has always said that Christ is going to come. Am I really ready? People started to inquire. And we know the story. Sadly, there was a great disappointment. Christ did not come. He did not come for the disappointment. And it was very, very, very disappointing. But this man, and I, I know they made this into a song, but I want to relate what he said once he passed the great disappointment. He said, although I have been twice disappointed, because it was twice, I am not yet cast down or discouraged. He said, I have fixed my mind upon another time. And here I mean to stand until God gives me more light. He was a light bearer. He did not understand everything. But he says, by faith, I'm going to wait on the Lord till he gives me more light. And this should be our condition, brothers and sisters. And today, and that is today. Today and today until he comes and I see him for whom my soul yearns. Is this the yearning of our hearts today. 
Light has been passed on to us by these faithful men and women. What are we doing with this light? And after this man, God called upon more men and women to effectively bring about the last message for this world that was found in the Holy of Holies where the law of God was contained. You guys remember this man? After the great disappointment, he was walking and his path was towards another house to encourage other brothers to pray, to have more light and understanding to what had happened. And as he was walking, he had a vision. We guess remember, you call this, right? And he saw the heavens open, just like Stephen when he was being martyred. And he saw Christ moving from the holy to the most holy place. And when he went out, he went out like the disciples coming back from Emos when they saw Christ with a great message, with a great burden in their hearts. This is the message. The cleansing of the sanctuary, the restoration of the sanctuary, the path back to Christ has been paved. We need to give this message to the world. And this started other men and women to come about. Rachel Oaks, she was a Seventh-day Baptist. And this woman was the one that one communion day, one Sunday communion day, with Pastor Frederick Wheeler, who was a Methodist, he was saying, brothers, we're going to have communion. And if you're not keeping the law of God as you should, you shouldn't be partaking of the communion. They had communion, and Rachel Oaks, after the communion, reached out to Pastor Wheeler and said, Pastor, you know, you're not keeping all the Ten Commandments. Pastor Wheeler was, you know, the pastor, right? What? I'm not keeping all the commandments? You know, what do you mean? And Rachel Oaks the, says his story. She brought him, she opened the Bible and related what Exodus 20, verse 8 says. Remember the Sabbath, the seventh day, the Sabbath day. And this pastor actually accepted the, 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 the message. And the next a few days, a few days later, he told his congregation, we will not have, be having any more Sunday worships or any more Sunday services. We will now get together the seventh day, the Sabbath. God was restoring again each article of the sanctuary. And actually the first, one of the first churches right there with the family of the France words is now, you could go visit it at Washington, New Hampshire. My wife and I had the privilege of going there. It's a beautiful place. Very inspiring. One of the first churches to keep the Sabbath. It was there with Rachel Oaks lived. And very close to that place lived this guy named T.M. Preble. And he also learned about the Sabbath and started writing about the Sabbath's truths. And he published this stuff in the newspaper and other articles and other uh, sources. And another man, reading, you know, searching for light, found a an excerpt of T.M. Preble, and said, wow, the Sabbath? This man was Joseph Bates. And they say that this man is actually the real father of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And when Joseph Bates was coming back from visiting, you know, the families that, that embraced the Sabbath, as he was coming back, the story says that as he reached home when he was at a certain bridge, they asked him, what's the news, Brother Bates? Or Captain Bates? And he yelled back, the news is that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. And this man was a true light bearer, brothers and sisters. You guys know the story. You guys seen the movie where, where, where they do the representation of the early fathers, right, with Sister White? I forgot the name of the movie. Tell the world. Thank you. And you guys recall that, that scene where um, Joseph Bates has no money? Like, they're like, they're like, with his wife, Prudence. They're like penniless. They don't have any food. And Prudence is like, I mean, do something, you know? And I don't know if you guys recall that he was writing in that time. They didn't really depict this, what he was writing. But what he was writing in that time was the truth about the Sabbath. He was writing. He was, he was being inspired by the Holy Ghost to write the truth about the Sabbath so that others would know. And that scene where he gets that letter that has money, you guys recall that part? That scene where he gets that letter with that money, he used that money just to buy food, 
But he used that money also to publish what he was writing about the Sabbath. And guess who found out about the Sabbath through there? Sister White and James White. You see how the chain goes? God starts bearing light upon his people and they start embracing it. And not only that, there was a very interesting story I wanted to share. Um, I was wishing not to make it too long with these stories, but they're very interesting. I, I get very passionate with them. Um, but there was Sister Smith. Sister Smith had embraced the messages of Joseph Bates of the advent of Christ and the Seventh-day Sabbath. And she had two children. One of them was Annie Smith. After the great disappointment, they had drifted away. They had, you know, they said, no way, this religion's not for us. We don't believe this stuff anymore. And basically, Sister Smith went to Joseph Bates and said, you know, Captain Bates, please pray for my children. They don't want to know anything about God. They, they just, they just, they just like, forget it, Mom. We don't want to know anything. So Joseph Bates said, you know what, I'm going to go to a certain town. I know your daughter's down over there. Why don't you tell your daughter to assist in one of my reunions? So Sister Smith, you know, sent a letter to Annie and told her, you know what, Brother Bates is going to be over there preaching. Why don't you go to one of his messages? Annie was very reluctant in the beginning. She didn't want to hear anything about this stuff anymore, right? But after she read the letter, she went to sleep. And she had a, she had a very interesting dream. She had a dream that she was walking into this church and she was walking in when they were singing the last hymn. And as they ended the hymn, this brother got up and started preaching about the 2,300 days. And she started having this dream of how she actually accepted the message and embraced it. And tears flew from her eyes and, and, and it was very moving. And then the dream ended. The same night, Joseph Bates had a dream. He had a dream that he was preaching at this chapel, this church, and at a certain moment when they were singing this hymn, a young lady would go in, and she, she thought it was like one of the daughters of Miss Smith. He recalled that she saw her come up and accept the message, and then the dream went away. Annie Smith and Joseph Bates, they both forgot about the dream throughout the day, and then that evening when they had the, the services, Annie decided to go. Well, you know, I'm just going to go satisfy my mom. When she got there, they were singing, they were ending this last hymn, the second hymn. And everything that she had dreamt, she started to remember, I had this dream. When Brother Bates was preaching, he saw Annie come in. And he started back there, sorry. And he started to remember what he had dreamt. At the end of the sermon, you know, he did an invitation. Annie Smith actually was convinced this is the truth. Gave her life to Christ. And Joseph Bates approached her and he said, you know what, Annie, I, I dreamt about you. Annie said, you know what, I dreamt about you too. And this was a big evidence that God, the Holy Spirit, was leading them. Brothers and sisters, Annie Smith later wrote to her brother what had happened. Her brother got convinced also by the testimony of her, of her sister, and later gave his life to God. Her brother's name was Uriah Smith. And this is how God started bringing people back in to the truth, bearing the light, one person at a time. Brothers and sisters, never underestimate your influence. Never underestimate what words of sympathy, of courage, you could give to your brother or sister. Maybe they've lived, drifted away, you know, they don't want to know about Christ, right? Don't give up on them. Pray for them. If you have children that have drifted away, pray for your children. The Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that led Annie and Arias Smith back to God is the same Holy Spirit that will lead your children back to God. Is the same yesterday, today, and forever he'll be the same. Trust in the power of God to rescue souls for his grace. God brought these great men to bring the truth. John and, and Andrews, he was the first missionary. You guys recall this, right? He went out to Europe, and the message went throughout the whole world. 
And this torch or this light has been taken from generation to generation. From there, from the United States, it went down to Mexico where my family knew the truth. From there, it went to Asia with the, you know, the Philippines where maybe you got the light. Who knows by who, by, well, from who, but it came down through the generations by these men. The sad thing is that back then the church was growing to like about 300%. Do any of you know what the growth of church, Seventh-day Adventist church today is? Not even half. Not even one-fourth of that. It's 2.5%. And it's good news because it's actually higher than a lot of the other evangelical churches. But it seems like we went into this, we came out into this 1800, 1900 century, coming into the 20th, 21st century, into this dark tunnel of entertainment and other stuff that started coming up. And the church that was back then in these times of these first fathers of the church and what we have now, seems like you think, what happened? What's happened? Why aren't we growing the same? Why don't we have that passion to share the message of Christ's soon return of the Sabbath? What has happened? Dear brothers and sisters, this message is still, is still valid today. It's still there for us. The pathway back to Eden is here. From the throne room of grace, from the most holy, Christ came down. He gave his life for us. He lived a life of being a light to the world, a, light, a life of prayer, a life where he, he, he lived by the word of God. He was baptized, and finally he gave his life for us. And there where he ended his ministry, that's where our life starts. We should sacrifice daily ourselves to him and go to the next step, be baptized. John chapter 3 says that we must be reborn again. Maybe you're already baptized, but the baptismal message or the labor represents that daily renewing of our spiritual life, being baptized by the Holy Spirit and of water. He says, if you're not baptized by the Spirit and of water, you cannot see the kingdom of God. We must go through the labor every day before we wake up. Don't get your cell phone. Get in your knees and ask for God, please baptize me today in the Spirit. I leave my soul unto you. I leave my life, my plans this day, I leave them to you. Take me as I am. May your will be done in my life and not my will. From there, we must live a life of daily communion with the, with the, with the Word of God through prayer as Christ prayed and be a witness to others. And finally, go into the most holy, to the throne room of God. And book of Hebrews says, come boldly into the throne room of God. And there we have the truths of the Sabbath and of other truths that we must inquire and dig out. The truth has not been just stuck there. It's not just, we're not going to see any more truths. There's more truths to be revealed. And God wants to reveal them. But we must search to them for them as gold. Well, I must say, brothers and sisters, give a depiction. We already saw what the past has brought us to. And now, in this world in which we are living today, Satan, that dragon, is also trying to destroy each article of truth from the sanctuary. The Bible truths. Who reads the Bible anymore? He says, well, don't persecute, don't change the Bible. But let's have them not read it. Let's entertain them with a bunch of stuff so they forget to read it. What about witnessing? Are we witnessing? He's effectively also affecting the way we witness to others. What about our prayer life? Do we pray as we used to? He's also affecting our prayer life. And I'm about to end right here. A few more slides. This writing was brought up by uh, Brother uh, Donnie uh, Kinlaw. And he says right here, maybe you can't see, I should have put it in a bigger uh, letters, but it says, Satan disguises submission to himself under the rules of personal autonomy. He never asks us to become his servants. He doesn't say, hey, come on, Seventh Adventists, worship me, I'm Satan. He never says that. Listen to this. He says, never once did the serpent say to Eve, 
I want to be your master. No. The shift of commitment is never from Christ directly to evil. It says it is always from Christ to self. And instead of his will being done, self-interest now rules, and what I want reigns. And he says, and this is the essence of sin. What does the satanic church, or you know, the, you know, the Luciferian church, or the New Era church uh, teach? What is their motto? Huh? Do as your will. Do as thou wilt. Do your will. Right? Follow your heart. Whatever you want, whatever you think is right, is right. And this, in essence, brothers and sisters, is, what say, is how Satan is getting homage in these days. But we must go back to the altar of sacrifice and surrender ourselves to God. Think about it. In Gethsemane, when Christ was praying there, those three prayers, what did he pray? His humanity was taking him to a place of comfort. Don't give your life for them. They don't, they don't deserve it. Look at Peter. He just, he's going to deny you. Look at Judas. He's, he's, he's betraying you. Don't give your life for them. And his humanity was taking him there. But what did he say? Not my will, O oh Father, but your will. And this should be our prayer too. We have the message of Paul who called at the end of his life and he prayed and he told Timothy, you know, I am about to give my life, but I fought a good fight. I have finished my course, he said. I have kept the faith. I have kept these messages till the end. He says, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me, but unto all them also that love is appearing. This is the message, brothers and sisters, that I want to give. Remember the past. Recognize the times in which we're living. And see that we have a future, a glorious future. I want to, there's a story of this pastor in Zimbabwe that gave his life. He was martyred. And after he was martyred, they found a, a, a letter that he wrote before he was killed. And I want to I read this story. It's, I've maybe read it before, but it's very, it's very powerful. And it's called the, the Fellowship of the Unshamed. He wrote a day before he was uh, killed. I am part of the Fellowship of the Unshamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. I won't look back. I won't slow down. I won't back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking. I don't want to do more small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarf goals. I don't want this anymore. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudity, popularity. I don't have to be right, first taught to recognize, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, am uplifted by prayer and labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough. My companions are few, my guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. Hesitate in the, pre in the presence of adversary. Negotiate the in the table of the enemy. Pander of the pool of pop popularity or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up. I won't shut up. I won't let up until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give it till I drop, preach till I'll know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, you'll have no problem recognizing me because my banner will be clear. 
My question is, is your banner clear? You know, brothers and sisters, this path that I just talked about, this path that I just talked about was stained with blood. And this blood was drawn, as the hymn says, from Emmanuel's veins. And this is the path that we must all trace if we want to be washed from our sins, but also receive grace and power to overcome our sins. It's a path back to, sanct to the sanctuary, back to Eden. It's the path back to our Savior, our loving Father, our God. Yes, the path is narrow, as it says here, but it's worth it. Once we lived in the presence of Christ, and we started, where did we start? In the throne room of God, remember that? It's all going to end there, in the throne room of God. And everyone will see the opportunities that God gave them. Those that were saved, says in the great controversy, they will cast down their crowns, and they will say, it's all because of him. He traced the path, follow the path, preach the path, live for it, die for it. It's worth it.